Good morning. Welcome to Columbia Law School. My name is Michael Gerard. I teach environmental law here, and I also direct the Center for Climate Change Law. I'm happy that all of you come for this very important program co-sponsored by the Center for Climate Change Law of Columbia Law School and the Section of Environment, Energy, and Resources of the American Bar Association. I'm going to start by asking Christopher Carr to say a couple of words. Chris was one of the principal uh, organizers of this conference. He's with the Washington office of the law firm of Vincent and Elkins, uh, formerly was with the World Bank and is an alumnus of Columbia Law School. Chris. Great, thanks. Well, on behalf of the American Bar Association, uh, just wanted to welcome everyone. Uh, really look forward to the day. It's going to be an interesting day. Uh, there's a number of very important uh, issues uh, to discuss. You know, obviously, looking um, at the climate change issues, there's really no way to find uh, a solution to these problems, to the problem of climate change, without addressing uh, biosequestration. Uh, looking at issues like avoided deforestation, uh, forestry more broadly, land use, uh, agricultural issues are just absolutely essential to sort of unlocking uh, the knot and finding a solution uh, to the problem of uh, climate change. Uh, the other thing uh, that's very interesting is how many issues are sort of embedded in the topic of uh, biosequestration, like many of the problems uh, that are uh, invoked by uh, the dilemma of climate change, uh, there's a whole mix of uh, talents and disciplines that go in uh, to funding a solution. So uh, there'll be plenty of things to talk about. Obviously, there's been a lot that's been taking place uh, looking at biosequestration, uh, both internationally and domestically. Uh, internationally, obviously, topics like reduced emissions from deforestation degradation have been a hot topic. Uh, under the Kyoto Protocol, there's been biosequestration projects uh, underway. Uh, some of those were the types of projects uh, I and others were working on at the World Bank. Uh, and domestically in the United States, um, despite, uh, well, I don't know how exactly uh, one wants to phrase uh, the uh, policy uh, momentum uh, in the United States, but there's been quite a bit of activity uh, of late. Obviously, we have uh, two major climate bills before Congress right now, and biosequestration really is at the heart uh, of those uh, bills in a number of important ways, and uh, I know this will be talking about uh, how that works uh, this afternoon. Um, but I'm very, very much looking forward to the first panel, uh, the science of sequestration, laying some of the groundwork uh, for uh, the future topics that will be discussed. Uh, other things that are, you know, of great interest, uh, we've identified a problem. Uh, there's important science to understand that underlies these issues. Um, but how do, what are the policy mechanisms that uh, need to be in place to address these issues? Uh, for projects involving biosequestration that take place, uh, what are the financing mechanisms uh, that will be necessary? What kind of incentives uh, are necessary to make these things happen? And what are the, the broader policy implications? Uh, all those things will be uh, topics uh, for the day. And uh, one of the interesting things about a conference like this is there's a great opportunity for the participants in this room uh, to be a major part uh, of the solution, of designing the approaches uh, to solve these issues uh, for implementing projects. So uh, in short, I uh, really look forward to the day. Uh, it's been great to work with uh, Columbia on organizing this conference, and um, look forward to hearing everyone's remarks. Uh, thanks very much. As Chris indicated, this first panel is to set forth the scientific uh, basis for a biological sequestration. Uh, we're first going to hear from Dr. Shahid Naim and then from Dr. Daniel Hillel. Ruth DeFries was planning on joining us, but uh, a few weeks ago uh, it became clear that she needed to be in Africa this week, so she's not here, but we have all of her topics covered. Um, each of the um, uh, speakers will talk for 20 to 25 minutes, and then after they are both done, uh, we're going to open it up for questions and uh, questions and answers. So uh, Professor Shahid Naim is a professor and chair of the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Evolutionary Biology here at Columbia University. Uh, he studies the ecological and environmental consequences of biodiversity loss. 
He's interested in how changes in the distribution and abundance of plants, animals, and microbes affect ecosystem functions, and by extension, how ecosystem services are affected. He's, uh, his current field work includes the American Northeastern deciduous forests and the Inner Mongolian grasslands in China. Uh, more biographical information about Professor Naeem and the other speakers is in the front of the book, and I'm pleased to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Naeem to the platform. Well, thanks, everyone, for um, showing up uh, this morning, and um, it's a great pleasure to be here and give a chance to, uh, to talk to you about the foundations of biosequestration. When uh, Michael asked me to do this, I um, uh, was somewhat surprised because I thought I usually have about 15 weeks or a semester just to go over one part of this. And he said I'd have about 20 or 30 minutes. So he impressed upon me what, um, uh, how uh, uh, um, uh, competent uh, the people in the law profession are <laughs> compared to those of us in the science profession. Um, so he said I should go to the very foundations, and so I thought I'd start. You probably found this fairly enigmatic figure at the very beginning. Um, this is actually a, um, a picture from a recent article in Science um, describing um, uh, the origin of our universe. And when I actually teach about this uh, topic, this is where I start, because I think it's important to recognize that what we're looking at is a globe that is set in the, uh, in the space of a, a very, very large universe. And we tend to forget that when we're here uh, distracted by, by problems right on the, on, on the um, Earth. Uh, uh, Daniel Hillel will, <laughs> will bring us back to Earth very quickly after I get through this. Um, so here, um, what we're looking at is the origin of the universe, the Big Bang, as they call it. And as you move down, you can see that there was a very, very long time, about half a billion years, where there was absolutely nothing in the, uh, uh, in the universe except for maybe hydrogen and helium and some plasma. And then eventually you had the first star form, and, um, and that's, that, that's that little dot up at the top. And then there are many stars, and then boom, we get to the universe we're here, we have today. And the reason that's interesting, aside from the fact that we sometimes forget that the universe was actually fairly dark for a very long time, is that this complex mess, which is our current universe, um, seems to be a popular topic among the public. And it's amazing how much uh, um, uh, research we, uh, funding we invest in that topic when right at home, our own planet is a little bit harder to understand. So these great pictures that you see from our incredible investment in space research comes from the Hubble Telescope. And for me, as an ecologist and someone who's interested in the environment, what that tells me is that if we didn't have that kind of chaos, we would not have had the formation of the elements, which is one of them, which we're going to be talking about a lot today. So the evolution of matter, just to remind you from your nuclear physics class you probably had a long time ago, that helium combines with helium to form beryllium, beryllium combines with helium to form carbon, and so forth and on you know, all the way to the table of the elements. So you notice carbon is actually a fairly um, uh, a lightweight uh, um, um, uh, element, and it is the hero of today's uh, uh, proceedings. I wanted to show you, uh, however, the other characters in this cast of characters, just to give you a frame of reference for uh, where carbon fits in the grand scheme of things. This is the abundance of elements in the universe. Notice that the scale is a log scale. So that means a small change up and down the graph means a dramatic change in the abundance. But you'll notice that after hydrogen and helium, carbon and oxygen become the two most abundant um, elements in the universe. And then it drops precipitously to the heavier elements. You notice things like mercury and lead, a couple of the last ones in the bottom are actually quite toxic to us. Those are the heavy metals. But life is actually made up of all that light stuff, all those light elements. So this is a, a, a book from a standard biology text which shows in green and, and the elevated cubes where the elements of life are and what the relative abundance of them are. And you'll notice that carbon um, has, a, uh, has a certain amount of abundance in life, but not nearly as much as hydrogen or oxygen um, or some of the other um, uh, uh, elements that we see there. Um, so what's interesting is to take a look at the distribution of these elements um, on Earth and um, compare what's in life to what's in, say, the crust or in the Earth as a whole or even in the universe. Rather than boring you with the table this early in the morning, um, I thought I would just circle the important bits there. You will notice that if you were to take 10,000 um, uh, uh, atoms at random from the crust of the Earth, which is what we're standing on, um, only seven of those, uh, uh, of those 10,000 would actually be nitrogen, and only 55 would be carbon. But if you look at life for every 10,000 uh, atoms, 
um, um, you would find, um, well, sorry, it's 100,000 for every 100,000 atoms, so it's even smaller than you might imagine, that 2,400 of every 100,000 atoms is nitrogen in us, okay, and um, uh, 10,700 of, of the 100,000 um, uh, atoms would be carbon. So what you did when you went to the back, if you did like I did and picked up a, a piece of cake or a cookie, or if you get hungry and you want lunch, what you're actually doing is trying to get more carbon and more nitrogen and some other stuff. But that's the big thing. Life on Earth requires carbon and nitrogen, nitrogen in huge um, amounts, and it is very uh, low in abundance on Earth. So that's an interesting um, dilemma that we have. In fact, when I teach biology, I often surprise the kids that I say that the definition of life might just be the pursuit of carbon and nitrogen. They wanted something more, something more poetic than that. Um, but that's what I put on the quiz. Um, so I don't know how many of you have watched Planet Quest and keep track. You can actually download this onto your laptop, so in the morning you can find it if we found another exoplanet. Exoplanets are planets outside of our solar system, and people have been finding more and more of them. We're up to 373. Whoopee! Time to build those spaceships. They're, of course, several hundred light years away. And um, this is what they look like, some artist renditions. Not one of them is an interesting place to go. They're massive. They're toxic. They would kill you in a second. This planet down here is my favorite. It has its atmosphere being stripped away from the sun, for which it is very close. Imagine when the sun rose in the morning on that planet, you would see a ball of fire occupy from one horizon to the other horizon, not a place you want to go anytime soon. We've now actually found a number of stars that have a number of planets. Absolutely none of them are habitable. So for those people who think that we can destroy this Earth and move on, um, you, know, uh, you might ask them where they, they get that idea from. So let's get down to Earth, and I want to give you a couple of examples of biosequestration because I have so, so little time that I think says it all. And you might be you know, surprised that I'm going to Jean-Baptiste uh, van Helmont uh, all the way back into the uh, 1500s. Um, and he did an amazing experiment. And what I like about it is that every one of you can do this experiment, and I'd encourage you to go home and do it um, after this, just so you can sort of get a feel. You, too, can participate in the research of biosequestration. What he did, well, well you know, a number of things he did was, one, he invented the word gas. Okay, so that actually sort of sets the time frame. Keep in mind that back then it was, it was actually the, um, the Aristotelian perspective that there was really only air, right? Earth, air, fire, and water. And there was only air. And to actually propose that air was made up of a number of gases was heretical. And given what the church did to heretics back then, this was quite a risky venture on his part. Um, the other, and I think this is one of the greatest ironies of science, is that he actually discovered a gas he called gas silvestre, sort of like a forest gas. And um, it was carbon dioxide. Of course, they didn't know anything about the periodic table of the elements right then, but he actually discovered this. And I'll tell you why that was ironic, because here's the experiment he did. He took a 200, of course, he didn't use the unit pounds. He didn't use the unit um, uh, kilograms either. He took 200 pounds of soil and a five-pound willow tree, and then after five years, he found that the willow weighed 164 pounds, okay? and that the soil weighed 199 pounds and 13 ounces. I've converted it to, to units you might be familiar with. And so um, he was really startled to find that everybody would have thought, and Aristotle would have convinced you, um, that life came from Earth. And as far as he could see from this very simple experiment, you can do this at home. It's great fun. This is actually probably the first documented biogeochemical experiment ever done, um, in which we carefully measured what had happened, that there was very little of the soil that actually went into making that big tree. So where do you think he came that mass? Where do you think he thought that mass came from? No one willing to volunteer? It's not a big class. What's that? The air. Wouldn't that have been great if he thought it was the air? Actually, he thought it was the water because he'd added so much water. He thought, he thought it must. So he actually would propose that life was made of water, not of earth, another heretical idea. Um, the great irony, of course, is that he had discovered carbon dioxide, which in fact turned out to be later what the tree was made of. I mean, we can forgive him. It must have been really hard for him to imagine that something like this, this is probably laminated, but let's say the laminated surface, which is wood, something hard like a baseball bat, could be made out of air, right? Now, most of us are kind of used to this idea, but even I think the public finds it very hard to understand that we can sequester from this atmosphere here something that could make wood or something that could make something solid. Um, and the second experiment, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, experiments you can't do today, was the experiments of Joseph Priestley, 
where he put a candle in a jar and it expired. He put a mouse in a jar and it expired. Can't do that experiment today. And then he put a mouse in a jar with a plant and the mouse did not expire as soon, nor did the candle expire as soon. And he made an incredible discovery um, back then. I think he's in all the textbooks in chemistry and in biology for that simple experiment. In fact, his, his findings were known to Ben Franklin and to Thomas Jefferson, who wrote about them. The world was really influenced. It's sort of interesting to me that it's still, it's sort of having sort of a, a reawakening um, in, in the modern age. But that simple experiment, I think, is captured by his, he, he, his description. He says, it is highly probable that the injury which is continually done to the atmosphere by the respiration of such a number of animals and the putrefaction of such masses of both vegetable and animal matter, meaning the rot or the decomposition, is in part at least repaired by the vegetable creation. How remarkable for someone back then to realize that there is a balance in the earth between the vegetation in the non-vegetable non um, uh, animal matter. I don't think he thought so much about microbial matter, but that's an issue we'll talk about later. Even so, he recognized this balance. And what I really liked is he didn't know what it was, right? But he said it seems to be extremely probable that the putrefly, the putrid, sorry, the putrid effluvium, um, that is whatever extinguished the candles in the mouse, um, is in some measure extracted from air by the means of the leaves of plants, and therefore that they render the remainder more fit for respiration. What a remarkable, I can't, it's just stunning that he figured this all out from a simple set of experiments. I also think, wouldn't it be terrific if we continued calling carbon dioxide the putrid effluvium? See, because <laughs> carbon dioxide is such a neutral term. I think, you know, if you're trying to say we want the EPA to declare this to be a pollutant, carbon dioxide, it sounds safe. In fact, you have seen ads where, you know, like carbon dioxide, what's wrong with it? It's an inert gas and so forth. Anyway, I like the idea of calling it a putrid effluvium, and I should probably try to push for that, that change in language. I want to show you some students actually demonstrating biosequestration because I think it, those of you probably know all of this really well, but to actually see it is really remarkable. And since it works so well for these, these students, I thought I'd share it with you. Um, what I had them do was try to demonstrate biosequestration in the field, and what they did was they built a box, and in that box, um, uh, uh, there is a couple of fans that circulates the atmosphere, and then that little uh, green box that they're fiddling with is an infrared gas analyzer, and it can measure the amount of carbon dioxide in the box. Um, and um, what they did is they put the box down on the vegetation, and they measured the amount of carbon dioxide in the box while the sun was shining for 60 seconds. It was done in Minnesota. If you've ever been in Minnesota, you do not want to be in a plastic box for more than 60 seconds in the summer, but that's, a long, that's as long as we thought the plants could take it. Look at the carbon dioxide there on the, um, on the uh, vertical axis. You'll see that before they put the box on, it was about 330 to 340 parts per million, which is about normal for the atmospheric concentration. And within 60 seconds, the carbon dioxide in that box plummeted to 290, right? That, I mean, imagine if that happened to our atmosphere. It would be plummeted into a glacial cycle within the space of 60 seconds. Of course, the atmosphere is bigger than that box. The time frame we're talking about is more than 60 seconds. And things happen at night that actually counter um, what happened in that box. But what a great way to visualize how vegetation removes the putrid effluvium from the atmosphere and actually produces more, more biomass. And I think for students to actually physically do this, I was tempted to try to do it here because I have the infrared gas analyzer, but I, and we could have clamped it onto a plant, but that would take too long. But I, I, I think you're familiar enough with this so we don't need to demonstrate it. Keep in mind it took over 200 years for people to work out photosynthetic chemistry and understand how it even works. So we're sitting on the top of a tremendous amount of research. You know, since then, this is a paper by uh, Hal Mooney way back in 1987 where we were trying to get people to pay attention to climate change and general global change factors. It's amazing to me as a graduate student from the 80s that we thought climate change was a done deal. And, you know, here, here I am almost 20 years later and there's still skeptics out there. Science is a slow process, um, uh, which, is, which, is a, which is a remarkable discovery for me. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind, I think, is to realize that the biosphere is actually a very, very thin, tiny amount of life. So maybe it's not surprising that people couldn't imagine that biology meant very much to something like a global climate cycle. If you look at that dashed line there, labeled as the biosphere, between the lithosphere, or the rocky stuff, and the atmosphere, the gaseous stuff, the sort of you know, thin tissue of life that's caught between these two spheres, that dashed line is actually drawn to scale. Okay? And that's a very generous description of how thick the biosphere is. And yet it is amazing, if you think about it, that that thin 
veneer of life coating the planet can move 100 gigatons of carbon per year between the atmosphere and the vegetation um, and, and uh, photosynthetic um, uh, organisms. And it can move a gigatons, you know, a gigaton is a massive amount of material. It's a billion tons of material or 10 to the 15 grams of material. And it's not just carbon. Now, that's a major point I'd like to, to, to bring up for you folks to consider. It's not just carbon. In fact, one of my concerns right now, especially at this conference here, is that we are so focused on carbon, we're running the risk of forgetting that carbon is just one element out of all those other elements I showed you. And at many of the different kinds of policy and legislation and movements that are going on right now to address the problem that's focused on carbon, may be making mistakes about things like nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus, and other elements in our, in our, our atmosphere. So um, included in your booklet is a material that I suggested might be valuable to you. Um, one is the, uh, the IPCC's most recent report. And um, just to remind you that, um, uh, you know, I won't go through this in detail. You have it in your book. But in fact, global warming, and I'm sure you all know this, but if not, it's a good thing. Because if we did not have these processes where we have 342 watts of energy coming in per meter square, which all, of course, all of it goes back out, right? If you look at what's going out, 107 is reflected, 235 is going out as long wave radiation. All of it goes back out. But the thing is, if it just simply hit the Earth and then went back out, our planet would be about minus 19 degrees Celsius, about minus 2 degrees Fahrenheit. That's how cold we would be. That's very cold. It's a warm day in Minnesota, but it's still very cold <laughs> in the winter. I was in Minnesota for four years. I can't help remember it. Um, and um, what happens is, of course, through uh, greenhouse um, uh, gas effects, and carbon dioxide being a very important one, the, the uh, infrared radiation is sort of reflected back and forth and retained, and we actually wind up like throwing a blanket over ourselves, keeping the heat around us, and making the planet a viable place. The reason I wanted to show you all those other planets is because if they don't have an atmosphere like ours, like in fact all of the planets in our own solar system, there is no global warming. And if there is no global warming, there is no life on this planet. And in fact, most of you know that you know, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere and the global temperature has changed dramatically over many, many um, eons. And ours is just something that's changing that we personally don't like. It's also changing very rapidly. So you can find out about that. The other thing about biosequestration, I think many of you have seen different versions of this. I like this simple black and white um, uh, illustration of this one here rather than the more colorful one like the one I, uh, it's in your booklet from Science, which just was recently published. But it's, it's very colorful and three-dimensional, and I'll show you a picture of that later. But if you look at carbon dioxide, and I think what's interesting about this diagram is that there are very, very large pools of it. The total pool, which is in the atmosphere, and the units are down there, again, 10 to the 15 grams or petagrams, um, there's 750 petagrams in the atmospheric pool. That's how much carbon is sitting on top of us. It's actually not a lot. Um, if you look at what's in the soils, you can see that there's twice as much in, the, in our soils, which is why we have a, a, a good section of uh, this morning's discussion will be devoted to that, that pool. Um, the land plants contain 560 um, uh, petagrams, and so you see that there's a certain amount of, um, of the, of the um, carbon which is stored in the biological part of our world, and this is what this, this conference is about. How can we use um, these living organisms here to control what is found inside those pools and also the rate of exchange between those pools in the atmosphere? Um, so here's the, you know, here's the big colorful diagram that you have in your handout, not in such color, but you can actually download it from the web if you want to. And it's amazing to me to actually see so much investment in producing nice, handy diagrams like this. You can make this as a poster and put it up in your house and have nice conversations at dinner about what's happening to our world. You will notice that if you look at this diagram here, that they do have the biota sitting out there illustrated mostly as a bunch of trees and they show it partly on fire. But the rest of the world is primarily agricultural and industrial and, um, um, and grazing lands, and that's where a lot of our, our biologically active carbon is. There's a lot going on in the ocean. It's very complicated, but that is something that if any of you want to, to ask questions about, I'll try to do my best to talk about it. But there is a lot of carbon that is stored in the, um, in the ocean, and it is not just a matter of the physics and the chemistry of the ocean. It's also a matter of the biology that's in there as well. And if you take a chance to look at that diagram, you'll see there are lots of organisms that control those flows. The other thing is that we're not quite sure, in spite of what you might get the impression from the literature, is about 
the carbon um, a cycle. There are parts that are still mysterious to us. And if you look at this diagram, it's a nice diagram because it, what it shows is what's being released and it shows what's being accumulated. It should be perfectly symmetrical um, <clears throat> uh, illustrations so that the top would be a mirror reflection of the bottom. And what's in it's in the uh, sort of orange or brown region there, right below that hor horizontal line, is the area where people are not actually sure where that carbon is going. And if you talk to some of the leading biogeochemists of our, of our day, like Bill Schlesinger, he'll say that, you know, this is actually sort of embarrassing that we still haven't been able to figure out where all of it goes, because it's important to part of our deliber deliberation. Some of the unidentified sink might actually be um, in the biological systems. Um, and then, you know, they describe that what we really want to understand is the ins and outs, and also remember the diagram over there on the right, showing that, um, over there, showing on, on, on your right, that the, um, uh, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has varied tremendously, but le recently it's been very low levels, and that's where we like it. Um, this is the relative amount of carbon dioxide compared to industrial time, so when you see that number 20, for example, over to the left, that means at one time the carbon dioxide was 20 times the concentration it is today um, uh, compared to pre-industrial times. So it does go up and down. We certainly do not want it to go um, uh, much farther from where it is. A very, very complex process, and I'd like you to see that the biosphere, um, uh, what's called a biosphere-geosphere interaction, is just one part of this very, very large picture. And I think this diagram, again from the IPCC, accurately reflects that a lot of attention is focused right now on industry, on agriculture, and on, say, uh, mechanical ways of sequestering carbon, but not so much on the biosphere. And our attention today is, in fact, focusing on only one part of the complex picture. You'll hear a lot more about soil. I just wanted to give you a uh, talk quickly about some popular, uh, there's a paper about this in your collection there. Soil is the third largest pool. About 62% of it is organic. And people are worried that warming could actually release all of that organic carbon to carbon dioxide. There's some argument, and we'll hear more about this, whether or not judicious management could actually keep some of that carbon in the soil and maybe even get more into it. But right now, the total amount that we're looking at is no more than about 3% of what's emitted through fossil fuels. There are other approaches, don't have time to go into them, but you know, if you, if you, I'm sure you're familiar and if you have questions, we can try to address them. A forestation putting forests back where they're no longer or where they never were for that matter, you know, not, people are not really quite sure whether this is going to work or not work. Crop albedo I think is interesting. Imagine genetically engineering corn so it would be more reflective, so it would throw more of that. You know, 40% of the earth is covered in crops, that might be a great thing to do, but the arguments go both ways about whether it work or not work. And then ocean iron fertilization has really turned out not to be the big promise people thought it would. If you add iron to the ocean, you would think that you would get more microorganisms to grow, sequester carbon, and then take that down into the ocean. It turns out it's not so easy to do. It's very expensive to do. And the results right now have been quite mixed. So here's the model. I call it the new model of sustainable development. And what I'd like you to think about is that we have people living in, in a, a, a priestly sort of jar. Okay, and that, that jar is where we are, and we have valves because we're the dominant species right now. We control everything for better or worse, um, and um, we are consuming uh, something like 23% of net primary productivity in the world, and we're one of 30 million species. I don't think there's ever been a single species in the history of our planet, all 3.5 billion years of the biological history, there's never been one species that's been able to consume one quarter of the Earth's solar um, uh, uh, biofuels. But if you look at what's left, what we call natural capital and man-made capital, uh, which is where agriculture and industry is, what you really want to do is maintain a balance between those two things. My concern is that biosequestration is mostly focused on trying to get carbon um, into uh, biological mass without considering the fact that biological mass produces lots of other things that we need. And in my um, conclusions here, what, you know, they're just two. Biosequestration is not a magic bullet. And you'll hear people say that over and over again. Some of the things I've given you will actually say that. That doesn't mean that it isn't a good thing. Because what I think is often forgotten, and what I'd like you to consider, is that when you're looking at our, um, people trying to look at biosequestration as a way to mitigate um, elevated levels of CO2, uh, remember that nitrogen and phosphorus are in serious um, shape. They're disappearing quickly, and, and, and we need them to, to support a growing human population. Biodiversity loss, we're in the sixth great uh, mass extinction of our world, is another serious problem. And we have a loss of a lot of other ecosystem services, which is my area of specialty, things like soil retention, the production of oxy oxygen, which we all need to breathe, and pollination. If you 
improve the amount of biomass on the Earth by biosequestration, you don't just get carbon out of the atmosphere. You get all those other things as well. And while they may not be marketed or they may not be valued, it isn't something that we should lose. So let's say if somebody says that changing soil uh, um, tillage practices would only net you a little bit of carbon to be stored, let's not forget that reducing soil erosion and growing cover crops and, and doing all the other great things that good soil practice provides us is an important part of that formula as well. So thank you very much. Get the next one up. Thank you so much. I'm now pleased to introduce Dr. Daniel Hillel. Uh, uh, Dr. Hillel is an international authority on sustainable management of land and water resources. He is most recently the uh, senior, uh, senior research scientist at the Goddard Institute for Space Studies here at Columbia University, its Earth Institute, and a professor of plant, soil, and environmental sciences at the University of Massachusetts. Uh, Dr. Uh, Hillel is the author of 20-plus books that include definitive works on arid zone ecology, low-volume irrigation, soil and water physics, and other topics. He has done uh, research in more than 30 countries in Europe, Asia, Africa, uh, the Americas, and Australia. Dr. Hillel. Thank you for that uh, generous introduction. And uh, now, by word of my own introduction, can you hear me now? Good. Ancient people realized the intimate connection of humanity with soil much more than we do today now that we're all, con we, most of us are concentrated in cities and uh, encased in asphalt and concrete. And we've lost that intimacy with the soil that was the mark of our forebears. An interesting symbolic manifestation was the name assigned to the first human being in the Hebrew Bible, which is part of the Christian Bible and which also is part of Muslim lore. The name Adam. What does Adam mean? In our language, Adam, we don't know Adam from Adam. But in the Hebrew, the original Hebrew, the Semitic language, Adam is the masculine form of the feminine Noun, Adama, meaning literally soil. And therefore, Adam means earthling. And indeed, that is how the creation of Adam is described in the first chapter of, or in the second chapter of Genesis, in the way uh, the good Lord fashioned the earth, fashioned the clay, the material of the soil and then breathed the breath of life into the first earthling, Adam. What is Eve, by the way? There was a film some many years ago all about Eve, but what do we know about Eve? Eve is the European or English mispronunciation of the original Hebrew Chava, meaning life the source of life. And therefore, together, Adam and Eve literally mean soil and life. Indeed, soil is the depository, the, that rich combination of mineral particles and organic matter and air and water that create terrestrial life. And so it is in this context that I will uh, continue my presentation, and I don't really need the papers because I have the screen here. Uh, this is a representation reminiscent of what we were given by Dr. Naim, and we'll skip over it because he explained it very well, and this is now a schematic summation of the, ex the depositories, 
and the exchanges of carbon between the three domains, the atmosphere above and the land and the ocean. That is the hydrosphere, the lithosphere covered by the pedosphere of the soil and the atmosphere above. And these are in constant dynamic interchange. And you can see that the quantity of carbon in the soil and the subsoil and the vegetation above is actually something of the order of four times the amount of carbon in the atmosphere in the form of carbon dioxide. And that amount has increased by some 30% in the last couple of centuries, actually most of it in the last century or so. And so it's extremely labile, that back and forth movement between the land, the ocean, and the atmosphere. Think of it as a dynamic system, literally a fluid system, consisting of the exchanges of gases, and uh, which is the, really the... Uh, the processes of life. So the Earth's terrestrial ecosystem is a bio-thermodynamic machine driven by solar energy and involving the exchanges of water, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, and other elements in the soil biota atmosphere continuum. And green plants, as uh, Dr. Naim pointed out, perform photosynthesis by absorbing atmospheric carbon dioxide and reducing it to forms of organic carbon in combination with soil-derived water while utilizing the energy of sunlight. Now, roughly 50% of the f carbon photosynthesized by plants is returned to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide in the process of plant respiration. The rest is incorporated in leaves, stems, and roots, and some of that is deposited within the soil, and their organic compounds are ingested by a diverse community of aerobic and anaerobic organisms. A handful of soil, imagine, contains millions of organisms, and they include primary decomposers such as bacteria and fungi, and secondary consumers, nematodes, insects, earthworms, rodents, etc., all the way up the scale, the food chain of life. The ultimate products of organic matter decay in the soil are a complex of relatively stable compounds, which are known collectively as humus. Incidentally, the word human in Latin means literally earth or earthling. Human is of humus. And as the Latins would say, homo homini lupus est, that man to man is sometimes beastly, but uh, it is of the soil something that the ancient forebears realized in all fundamental cultures and that we tend to forget today. So, the world soils are major absorbers, depositories, and transmitters of organic carbon, and they contain some 1,700 gigatons to a depth of one meter and about 2,400 gigatons to a depth of two meters. And that is uh, something of the order of four, even uh, close to five times the uh, carbon that is uh, contained in the atmosphere. Or, and consider that the atmosphere has been augmented to the, to the tune of about 30 to 40 percent in the last few centuries, especially since the Industrial Revolution. So the original imbalance was even greater. The quantity of organic carbon in soils is spatially and temporally variable depending on the balance of inputs versus outputs over time. And uh, there is a great difference among soils. Here is a kind of a scheme, a schematic representation of the 
processes involving carbon in plants, in the atmosphere, in the soil, mediated to some extent by animals, including the animal known as Homo sapiens, well represented in this room. Now let's look at a map, a soils map, a global, so the global regions. And we find that there's a tremendous heterogeneity, that when we talk about the soil, that's an abstract concept. Soils differ greatly from zone to zone. And if we look at a table, and we'll skip over the large table and look at the concentrated table, we see that there's a tremendous amount of carbon in soils, in particular soils, in terms of gigatons. Remember, the atmosphere contains 750. So if we look at the entosols, the gelosols, the histosols, and septosols, and mollusols, and these are the carbon-rich soils, such as the tundra soils, which are now quiescent, but as the earth warms with climate change, they are likely to be drained of water and at first they will spew out methane, and then as they drain, they will begin emitting carbon dioxide. So here's an example of a possible positive feedback in which global warming is going to induce additional global warming by causing the soils of wet regions and especially cold regions, the frozen soils, to release tremendous amounts of carbon dioxide. Warm regions also contain some organic soils, the bogs, the marshes, and so on. And they too can release a lot of carbon dioxide when they are drained. And so soil, unfortunately, in the course of recent history, has been a source of the so-called greenhouse effect by emitting carbon dioxide as well as methane and nitrous oxide which is a, an even more potent, much, much more potent greenhouse gas. Now let's look at a few soils, and these are the generally the carbon-poor soils, such as the soils of arid zones. And these are the relatively carbon-rich soils. Soils differ from location to location, differ dramatically. And their responses to the cycle of water and the cycle of energy and the possible change of climate, their responses are going to be very, very different, and we have to be very, very concerned about that. Now, I mentioned that soil formation involves the interaction of climate, topography, geology, biota, and time, a very complex series of processes, and these differ from region to region. Soils with high contents of carbonaceous matter, known as organic soils, typically form where prolonged saturation of water relongs, results in a deficiency of oxygen, which inhibits decomposition and promotes the gradual accumulation of organic matter. When converted to agricultural use, such soils are typically drained, aeration is accelerated, decomposition then spurs the emission of carbon dioxide. And cultivated peat soils may lose as much as 20 tons of carbon per hectare per year in uh, tropical and subtropical climates. And I mentioned that of special concern are permafrost wetlands. Soil carbon balance is greatly influenced by human management, including the clearing or restoration of natural vegetation and the modes of land use. Cultivation spurs the microbial decomposition of soil organic matter while depriving it of replenishment, especially if the cropping program involves removal of plant matter and if the soil is kept bare seasonally. Organic matter is lost from soils both by oxidation and by erosion of topsoil. Some cultivated soils may over time lose as much as one-third to two-thirds of their original organic matter content. And consequently, soils degrade in quality, fertility, and structure. So it's a losing proposition all around. So though agricultural soils, this is an extremely important 
statement to be translated into action. Though agricultural soils acted in the past as significant sources of atmospheric carbon dioxide and therefore contributors to the greenhouse effect and to climate change, their present carbon deficits offer an opportunity to absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and to store it as added organic matter in the future decades. So we, from, we can shift from a lose-lose proposition to a win-win proposition. The historical loss of carbon in the world's agricultural soils is variously estimated to total some 42 to 78 billion tons. Substantial restoration of that loss may be achieved by minimizing soil disturbance while optimizing nutrient and water supply to maximize plant production and residue retention. And the good news is that there is a new paradigm of agriculture which is being adopted on a wider and wider scale, and that is zero-tillage agriculture, which retains as mulch the residues of plants and in every sense tries to augment soil organic matter. This is more and more widely adopted, still a ways to go, but a good beginning has been made. This is a sad and sorry example of how soil is abused, how topsoil is allowed to erode and to decompose, and in its stead, soil, desirable soil management, of course, provides not only soil conservation, but augmentation of fertility and absorption of carbon. So instead of that vicious cycle of degradation affecting food security and environmental quality, we are about to begin, we have begun, a benign cycle of productivity gain. Enrichment of the topsoil with organic matter makes it less prone to compaction, crust formation and erosion, and potential carbon sequestration in agricultural soils is estimated to total some six to 900 megatons per year over a period of several decades. Now, what are the recommended practices? These are reforestation, agroforestry, no-till farming to avoid mechanical disturbance of the soil, and, of course, the unnecessary spewing out of uh, fossil fuels by the operation of the unnecessary, exaggerated operation of machinery, shortening or elimination of fallow periods, augmentation of soil nutrients by appropriate fertilization, judicious fertilization, not excessive so as not to cause environmental pollution, manures, composts, sludge, application of soil amendments such as lime to neutralize acidity, improved grazing, soil water conservation, and in some cases the production of energy crops to replace fossil fuels. There is a necessary caveat, however. Soil and economic conditions differ greatly from one location to another and from one period to another, and therefore there can be no simple universal prescription regarding practices to manage soils to help mitigate the greenhouse effect. Now here is a kind of schematic representation of what happens when cultivation begins, the labile part of organic matter, that is recent residues of plant and animal matter, decompose very quickly. Then in the soil there is a relatively stable organic matter fraction which is attached to soil grains, mostly to the clay in the soil, occluded in aggregates of soil. And that decomposes much more slowly, but also decomposes over time. Now, after the beginning of these practices that I mentioned of carbon sequestration in soils, we can begin to recover that. Perhaps not entirely, but over a period of some scores of years, we can, soil management can contribute to the mitigation of the greenhouse effect rather than to its exacerbation. 
And what are these practices? I mentioned reducing the emissions caused by agriculture by adopting such practices as no-till plantings, absorbing atmospheric carbon dioxide by enhanced photosynthesis and storing that in the soil, and to some extent producing renewable biofuels from biomass, which is convertible to ethanol and biodiesel. A good example is what is being done in Brazil. They rely to a growing extent and now to uh, most of their fuel use, I think, is based on conversion of biomass. The necessary caveats are that some practices aimed at intensifying agricultural production entail increased use of mechanical or chemical energy, such as irrigation, fertilization, pest and weed control, and transportation, and all this needs to be controlled and minimized. And the potential sequestration of organic matter in soils is generally finite. It's not infinite. It cannot continue indefinitely. But it is still substantial. So economic policies are needed to promote carbon-efficient practices. Schemes to reward carbon sequestration must be based on effective monitoring, which is very difficult because the soil is very heterogeneous. And we need to develop schemes of reliable sequestration so as to prevent uh, exaggerated claims and also to prevent uh, farmers from, after accumulating carbon in the soil over a period of years, then reverting to the old methods of cultivation and spewing all that back into the atmosphere. So it needs to be controlled, monitored, and, and that is difficult, but possible. So I believe I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip some of this. It will come up in subsequent conversations, I believe, the various mechanisms proposed both nationally and internationally to encourage uh, the uh, sequestration of carbon and the challenges and the credits that are generated, and uh, all of this is now in the making. These are not fixed agreements, not fixed mechanisms, but very much in debate. The current situation is there are several catchphrases such as clean development mechanism. That's something much debated now in international circles as well as national circles. In Canada and the U.S., there is even something called the Chicago Climate Exchange that may be brought up later here to discuss its potentialities and limitations. And now I'm going to skip this too and end, rest my case, with these two alternative graphs. One is the mismanagement of agroecosystems all too prevalent in the past. And that causes, that begins with biomass burning or clearing of covers, cutting of trees for fuel, losing biodiversity, denudation of land, overgrazing, loss of organic matter, water logging, emission of the major greenhouse gases of carbon dioxide, methane, and this should be N2O rather than NO2, the uh, nitrous oxide emissions, nutrient leaching, wind erosion, sheet and gully erosion, crusting, compaction, productivity loss, altogether resulting in ecosystem degradation. So that rich material of the soil, the fount of terrestrial life, is degraded, tragically. There is hope, and it's practical, and that is managing agroecosystems for sustainable production. And it begins with agroforestry and intercropping and pasture improvement and conservation tillage, maintenance of biodiversity, mulching and green manuring, organic matter enrichment, drought contingency so that we do not over-cultivate soils during periods of drought, carbon sequestration, 
enhancing both fertility and soil stability, soil and water conservation, germplasm conservation, and productivity increase. An upward spiral, which we advocate today. It's not easy, but it is possible. And with that, I rest my case. Rest with a W. Thank you for those two fascinating presentations. We have about 15 minutes for questions. Yes, sir. Could you use, if you press the button, there will be a microphone, and we're tape recording, uh, we're videotaping this actually, so that will be helpful. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I believe you were the author of a book several years ago uh, dealing with the land of Israel and references in the Holy Bible to environmental impact. It was a fascinating book. Um, is it your position that uh, the ancient people were sensitive to some of these things that you're talking about today, soil management and other type of environmental impact? And if so, what, if anything, they do in terms of you know, principles of conservation? Ancient people lived in much closer intimacy with the land than we do today. We live in air-conditioned rooms and the, the, the lighting is artificial and so on, and they were out there. And they observed their livelihood depended utterly, completely, on understanding nature and managing within it. I wouldn't say quite managing nature because that's almost beyond the ability of human beings, but managing within it and harmoniously as much as possible. But there was never an ideal situation, and I don't want to create the impression that they were great uh, conservers they tried. They tried their best. They discovered ways, for example, of terracing hillsides when their population grew and the valley lands could no longer sustain them. So they began to cultivate hillside soils and learn to terrace them, to conserve them. They learned to collect runoff water in watertight cisterns. And they noticed that the soil was depleted over time, and so they declared a moratorium every seven years to let the land rest and revert to natural vegetation, the sabbatical year, so to speak, called Shemitah in Hebrew. And so they tried. Unfortunately, the ancient Hebrews who wrote the Bible chose to settle in a very inauspicious location, in that narrow corridor of land twixt uh, sea and desert, uh, which is uh, at the very juncture of the ancient civilizations of Egypt and Mesopotamia and the Hittites and then the Greeks and the Romans. And so they were repeatedly overrun by superior forces and eventually forced to abandon uh, their land and were led into exile. So it, it is a, a kind of bitter history of a struggle not only with the elements but also with the human circumstances that would despoil uh, their, uh, the land as well as the livelihood of, of people. And so if you read the Bible uh, from the point of view of an environmental scientist, as I have tried to do. I published a book, by the way, a couple of years ago called The Natural History of the Bible, an Environmental Exploration of the Hebrew Scriptures. And you need not worry because it's not a religious book. Uh, I wouldn't uh, presume to, <laughs> uh, to write a religious book. But it is a book about the connection of civilization with the environment throughout the course of of history, uh, and the Bible, of course, is a compendium. It's not a unitary document. It's, a, it's a, a collection, a compendium of works written over a period of a thousand years. 
sort of uh, edited, redacted, given a semblance of unity, but it shows the... In, there are many passages there that reveal the connection between uh, uh, people and the environment and the transition of people from nomadic existence to sedentary life and to the management of soil and water and vegetative resources. So um, uh, thank you for mentioning that. I think it's extremely interesting to study history as well as the contemporary phenomena. How do we get to where we are today? Including not only our practices, but also our beliefs, our perceptions of the environment and of our of human relationship to the environment. Thank you. Yes, I was curious as to whether either of you could uh, speak to the use of biochar as either an historical or perspective um, uh, um, technique to improve soil carbon. Uh, biochar, those who don't know, is a method of uh, collecting organic matter and then pyrolyzing it, that is, uh, heating it up in an oxygen-low environment. So it does not, is not converted directly into carbon dioxide. The organic matter is charred. It, it is pyrolyzed. It turns into a chemical form that is recalcitrant, that then, that then uh, resists further decomposition and then taking this material and incorporating it into the soil, and it becomes very stable. The person who discovered this was the former director of the Land and Water Division of FAO, and uh, who, who uh, worked in Brazil and discovered that in Brazil, in uh, the Amazon Basin, which is very tropical with a tremendous amount of rainfall and highly leached soils, there were pockets of land that were highly enriched in organic matter. And that was done by the ancients who collected material, set it on fire, and then covered the fire with a layer of earth so as to deprive it of oxygen, and in essence pyrolyzing it, and then spreading it over the land, incorporating the soil, and enhancing the fertility of these generally infertile soils of the uh, of the humid tropics. We think of the humid tropics as, as superficially, we think of them as very fertile because they give rise to luxuriant vegetation. But this luxuriant vegetation is based on re constant recycling of the nutrients. And once we remove the vegetation, the soils are so highly leached that they uh, quickly lose their fertility. And this was a way of maintaining fertility in tropical regions. Now there are, so there's promise to the process of pyrolyzing and uh, enriching with this so-called biochar. There is a negative side. The negative side is that it's extremely laborious, that it requires a source of organic matter and then uh, taking it into a pyrolyzing plant and uh, charring it and then bringing it back to the soil and, and incorporating into the soil. All this, the energy balance of this entire operation is, has, has been called into question and its application on a large scale is also questionable. So it is a method. And I should say at this point that there is no single solution to any of the problems that we have that there are many approaches and some would fit some circumstances and others would fit other circumstances. There's no panacea. And that may be one approach in certain conditions, but it is not a global answer. Thank you. I guess this would be for either panelist. I'm counsel to soybean corn growers in the U.S., and we're trying to get more sustainable. And one of the tools we've been using is the genetic engineering, and certainly for the soybean, that's enabled no-till. And we're seeing corn, it's not as easy to do no-till, but with a few new traits down the pipeline, we'll do a lot more no-till corn as well. 
but we're finding the international community, Kofi Annan to, and even home, West Jackson at the Land Institute, have sort of a knee-jerk opposition to the use of this technology. But do the panelists have any views on the potential role for that? Well, I think when it comes to um, the use of genetically engineered crops, you'll always find a wide diversity uh, of opinions uh, about that. Um, let me start more broadly from a sort of global scale. I guess one could ask whether or not continuing investment in uh, high-intensity monoculture agriculture is the, um, is the best way to go. Um, it's one option, um, but it's not the only option. And I think very often people look at corn as something that they know really well and soybean as well. And so their quick um, uh, uh, reaction to how to solve a problem is to try to re-engineer it or retool it. But there are lots of negatives to having monoculture agriculture, especially ones that are you know involve a lot of intense use of irrigation and um, biocides and, and so forth. That suggests maybe there are alternatives that one, one could approach. Um, so genetically engineering Corn for greater albedo effects is a, another way to go. In, you know, engineering them for um, resistance to herbivores, engineering them to be more tolerant to, sal to uh, salinity. It, it, it continues to drive <clears throat> this idea that we can solve all our problems with one plant, and I'm not sure that that's the, the best idea. That's why you'll encounter resistance to it. Um, <clears throat> so, so that's sort of m my, my perception of it, that we start, you pull back and you ask, Maybe the question is whether or not so much land devoted to monocultures of um, corn and soybean and wheat and so forth is really the best way to go. And might there be a, a tremendous gain that we could get by considering alternatives rather than constantly trying to improve the system that we have in place? I don't know. I can ask Daniel Hillel about that. Can you hear me now? Good. I... To some extent, I agree, and to some extent, I disagree. <laughs> so uh, without being disagreeable, I would say that uh, one of the problems of contemporary agriculture is uh, that it's encroaching increasingly upon natural ecosystems and despoiling natural ecosystems and uh, doing it on a very extensive scale and rather poorly. One possible answer is to withdraw agriculture from marginal or submarginal lands and stop encroaching upon ecosystems, natural ecosystems, and concentrating agriculture on favorable areas, in favorable areas, and managing and in intensifying it, intensifying it by genetic improvement by controlling the environment, by effective and efficient methods of soil conservation and management in general, precision fertilization, increasing control over the microenvironment of uh, crop production in concentrated areas where we have proven the ability to obtain yields per land area and per unit um, input of water and nutrients, sometimes tenfold over the extensive agriculture now practiced uh, widely in places such as Africa, causing a tremendous scale land degradation and deflation by wind and erosion by water and, and so on, so forth, depletion through leaching and destabilization of soil structure. So uh, there is no single panacea, as I pointed out before, but one possible way is to intensify production on favorable lands and to do so based on the principle of efficient management and conservation of the resources uh, rather than expanding it and thereby despoiling more and more land and ruining natural ecosystems with their tremendous, uh, tremendously important services to uh, 
the biosphere. One final question. In listening to the discussion about soils um, as opposed to forests, it, it seems, that, and maybe I'm ignorant as to the precise uh, structure of all the international negotiations that are underway, but it seems that there's sort of a hole here potentially in that where agriculture meets the rainforest, international treaties are dealing with these issues, but to what extent do you believe international treaties are adequately dealing with these issues where that's not the case, where you just have agriculture? <coughs> Well, I think a lot of in a lot of cases, what you have is a rapid transition from forest uh, to agriculture. So, in a way, um, it sort of depends which way the the direction is going. I think there is a lot of international legislation, certainly a lot of interest in trying to reduce the rates of deforestation and to try to increase uh, planting. Uh, you know, this this international push to do tree planting, where they I think they've reached what is it? Eight billion trees have been planted now. Well, some of these trees that have been planted are exotic trees and habitats where they don't particularly belong. But that's a separate issue. Um, I think um, we focused on soil um, here t today as, as um, something that I think is um, actively um, uh, uh, pursued in looking for mitigation um, uh, strategies. But there's a lot going on, as you know, in, in, in forestry as well. Uh, the, the red um, uh, initiatives, the, a lot of the carbon, um, the voluntary carbon markets and carbon credits are looking for um, uh, giving credit to people who uh, have better forestry practices and avoid deforestation. Um, I think in both cases, um, there's still this 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 um, idea that the biosphere itself is only going to be a small part of the whole picture, and so uh, the international agreements are are. are focusing a lot on all sorts of uh, issues, not just um, uh, uh, forestry and soil. The other thing is I think when you get to forest, and this is just a, a sort of personal perspective, maybe it's because of the department that I chair, then when it comes to forestry issues, it gets very heavily tied into conservation issues, and that complicates the picture um, um, quite a bit. And um, I think when it comes to whether or not you can change the way we manage our soils and manage our farms, we don't have the sort of conservation questions which complicate things. Um, uh, and, and, and even this, this argument about whether or not we could um, take areas and increase the intensity of agriculture to spare um, the, uh, um, the, the, I think ruination was the word that used, of, of other ecosystems and the services they provide, is um, uh, something that still seems to you know, get away from this problem about conservation. Um, one other thing is that, you know, and I guess I work with Pedro Sanchez, who's a, who's a, a well-known um, soil biologist. He's a recipient of the World Food Prize, and he's working in the Millennium Villages with the Earth Institute in Africa. You know, he constantly reminds us, especially someone like me as an abstract, as a scientist who does abstract research, that, um, you know, 48% of, of the people of the world are making less than $2 a day. So that's... Three billion or more people making less than two dollars a day, and if you travel to those lands as I have, and this summer I went to a bunch of different countries to see this, um, these are not places where options for high intensity agriculture is either you know financially viable or ecologically sound. Um, it is difficult to come to a place and see where they once ate manioc that they're now trying to grow corn in a system that actually isn't very well suited for growing corn. When I was in India for the first time this summer, and as you know, central India and parts of India went through one of the worst droughts that it had gone through in, I think, 10 or 20 years. And um, this place was where I was traveling were large areas that had been converted by the Green Revolution to produce primarily one crop of rice per year. And um, we happened to go into the forest, because there was a wildlife reserve nearby, just for about five hours. Um, out of my out of my week that I was there, but when we entered the forest, it was green, it was cool, it was filled with wildlife, and when we left the forest, it was a large barren landscape and they need the rice, but they also needed a lot of the services that the forest provided so there 's a case where I think something like regrowing those forests, uh, especially in the face of climate change, 
even independent of whether or not you're going to get more carbon out of better management of the rice paddies or better management of the forests, there's still a lot of other services that would come to them. I think they would have been much better off if they hadn't converted so much of their land to these rice paddies, which are barren until the monsoons come for most of the year. Uh, my good and esteemed colleague, uh, uh, Professor Naeem, and I agree over so much. And now we have finally, as we rest, come to close to resting our case, we've come upon a point of disagreement. And uh, uh, e even uh, something of a contradiction. If you're going to release land to forests, then almost by definition you have to intensify production on the remaining cultivated land. And I want to mention one particular practice that has we've mentioned in passing, and that is high intensity irrigation, such as drip or trickle irrigation. That's an example, a prime example, and because I participated in the development, in the early development of the concept and the technology, the technique of drip irrigation, I can tell you that one has the potential here of economizing in the use of water and making it sustainable and producing and actually multiplying the yield of crops per unit volume of water applied. Conventional irrigation generally is based on flooding the land excessively, restricting the aeration of the root zone, leaching of nutrients, uh, also, uh, waterlogging the soil so that the productive potential is, re is reduced, whereas the simple way of applying the water efficiently, drop by drop, and injecting fertilizers in the precise amount calibrated to answer the variable needs of growing crops increases efficiency and intensity of production so that it allows the release of land which you advocate and I uh, support. Uh, marginal land, let it revert and even encourage it to revert to natural ecosystems with their services. Sustaining life on a large scale, intensifying production where it is most suitable, and that means more precise, more careful, sustainable modes of soil use and water use, and of course, the genetic improvement of crops. I think that's one of the ways to go in the future, in the future of agriculture. Thank you very much. I rest my case. Dr. Naeem, Dr. Hillel, thank you very much. We'll take a break now and resume at 10.30.